Welcome to Skillsoft Off the Shelf. I'm Charlie Taylor, talking with Peter Bregman, author of Leading with Emotional Courage. Peter shows how anyone can develop their emotional courage muscle using practical advice and exercises to help leaders connect with their team and overcome daily challenges. Peter, welcome to Skillsoft Off the Shelf. Nice to be here. So previously you've written direct and concise books on how to be more productive, how to master distraction and get things done. Uh, it looks like you've now turned your attention to leadership. So what brought you to writing this new book? All of my books really have to do with leadership and life. All of them have to do with how we show up in life and then how we move ourselves through difficult moments and how we bring people along with us to difficult moments. So if you think about 18 Minutes, which was my big book on managing time, it was all about how we find our focus and manage distraction and get the right things done. And it's about really what all of my work is about, which is getting massive traction on our most important work. And sometimes that's very individually focused. Sometimes that's about sitting down and creating the right kind of a to-do list that helps to focus us in a way that our most important work is getting prioritized. Sometimes, like with my book before this one, Four Seconds, it's about habits and the way we prevent ourselves from taking counterproductive actions that get in our own way. And, and then sometimes it's, it's leading with emotional courage, which is this book. And one of the things I really like about the title, and I fought hard for this title, um, is that there's a double entendre to it, which is leading with emotional courage is both about who we are as leaders in the world and showing up with the kinds of emotional courage that allows us to get important work done. Some of it also is leading with emotional courage as in starting with emotional courage. Like you, you start, you, you begin with emotional courage because anything important that we want to achieve has to start with emotional courage. In fact, if we don't have emotional courage, chances are we won't actually start, right? It gets in our way of beginning anything really, really hard. So I've always written for leaders, but I've always written for leaders as people. Everything that I write and everything that I think about is who you are as a human being and who you are as someone who moves through the world to make things happen as a leader, either of yourself, of the people around you, of large organizations. You know, any of that to me is really about taking strong, powerful action to impact the world. We've paid a lot of attention to emotional intelligence and not as much to emotional courage. What's the difference between emotional courage and emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence, which I think brought a lot to the business conversation that wasn't there before, is largely, and maybe ironically, an intellectual conversation. For the most part, emotional intelligence is about what you know. I mean, I know technically with emotional intelligence it's what you know and what you do or what you say. But the way that conversation has taken place in organizations is how savvy are you with emotions and how much do you know? And it even goes along with that term of emotional intelligence. It's the sort of awareness of, of and comfort with emotions. Emotional courage is very much about what you're willing to do in the face of emotions. So emotional courage is very action oriented and emotional courage isn't just what you know, it's what you're willing to feel. So while the emotional intelligence conversation has largely been intellectual, the emotional courage conversation is actually very emotional and psychological. The challenge of emotional courage is, am I willing to feel the things I need to feel in order to do the things I most want to do? Right? That's the challenge of emotional courage. If I'm not willing to feel everything, then I'm going to limit my own freedom. I'm going to limit my ability to move forward. If I want to take a risk, I'm going to have to feel things. I'm going to have to feel the possibility of failure. I'm going to have to feel the possibility of my disappointing you. I'm going to have to feel any number of things. And if I'm not willing to feel those things, I'm not going to take that risk. So emotional courage is really about, am I really willing to feel the full gamut of emotions, the possibility of shame or embarrassment, the possibility of joy and success, the possibility of, of failure and struggle and frustration? Am I willing to feel it all? in order to do the things that I need to do, to show up in the ways that I need to show up in order to accomplish my most important work. And that's the conversation of emotional courage. So your book is built around four themes. Let's talk about each one. Sure. So let me, I'll, you know, what I'll do maybe is I'll point out the four elements, what I call the four elements of leadership, and then we'll sort of dive into to that first one. 
And, and this is after you know, 30 years of research and, and looking at what makes people successful and, and also like me search, right? Looking at what, what you know, I struggle with, which all of my writing always, I'm not some guru from on up high that descends my heavenly perch to share my great wisdom and then go back to my perfect life. I struggle with all the same things and I work at it and I explore it out of my own curiosity in order to understand it. So these are the four things that everybody needs in order to successfully lead, whether they're leading in their own lives or whether they're leading large organizations. And the first one is confidence in yourself, like a sense of self. And by confidence, I don't mean arrogance. I mean, I mean actually security and groundedness. In fact, arrogance comes from the opposite. It comes from a lack of confidence in yourself. But a confidence in yourself, you can even think of it as comfort with yourself, is a real groundedness. And that's the piece that you're talking about in terms of knowing yourself, which is one element of confidence in yourself. The second piece is connection to others, which is about your relationship with others and how much you understand them and they understand you and how curious you are and how trusting you are. The third is commitment to purpose, which is bigger than you and bigger than me. And it's what are we all going out there to try to achieve? What are we working towards? And the fourth is emotional courage, which underlies all of them. They all build emotional courage and they all rely on emotional courage. And the reason I call these four elements is because you need all four of them. So you cannot lead successfully with one or two of them. If you're confident in yourself but not connected to the others, everything will be about you and you'll never end up drawing other people in, creating loyalty, creating commitment, you'll just leave people behind and they'll leave you behind. If you're connected to others but not confident in yourself, then you leave yourself behind. And we all know people who will give themselves up in order to please others. And if you're committed to purpose but not connected to yourself or others, then you're going to go whole hog into something that feels really important and burn out and leave yourself and others behind at the same time. So you really need uh, simultaneously confidence in self, connection to others, commitment to purpose, and then emotional courage, which is the willingness to feel the things in order to be confident, connected, and committed. So in terms of the confidence in yourself piece and the comfort with yourself, you're asking about exercises, like what you can do. And one thing that I want to share is in, in the book, Leading with Emotional Courage, and it's also on our website at, at BregmanPartners.com, there's an assessment. And the assessment looks at all four of these areas, confidence in self, connection to others, commitment to purpose, and emotional courage. And actually, each question of the assessments relates to one of the chapters. So there's 48 short chapters in this book, a couple of pages each, and each one has a question of the assessment. And that's one of the first exercises, I would say, to really make sure that you do in, in kind of getting a better sense of yourself. Because that exercise, that assessment, will help reflect to you how, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses connected to myself, connected to others, connected to commitment to purpose, and connected to emotional courage? Where do I have room to grow? Where do I have you know, a real strength that I can leverage? So that's one of the first things I would do. Another thing I would do is meditate. I'm a big believer in meditation. And even if meditation is only sitting for five minutes and feeling what you're feeling, it's a great exercise for building an awareness of what's going on for you. Another uh, exercise you could do is try to pursue a decision that you know is different than the people around you. And this could be small. It could be, you know, you're at, at a dinner and everybody's eating meat and you decide, you know, I'm going to go vegetarian. And, and it's about being willing to be different amongst people who you're connected with and not giving up your connection to them, but also not giving up the thing that you most want. So not giving up what you care about in order to fit in, but fitting in while standing strong in your stuff. So those are all, those are like a few exercises that you can do. There's more in the book, obviously, but those are a few things that you can do to sort of better establish your confidence in yourself, your comfort with yourself, and ground, ground yourself in that first element in the book. Um, and just curious, do you have a favorite exercise for yourself that you do? Yeah, I mean, I meditate twice a day, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, and that really helps. I do, one of the things that I do, I've done recently, in fact, I, I actually got my 16-year-old daughter to do this with me. Um, we had a birthday party uh, at, and for her when she turned 16, and I said to her, instead of, every, we were all at, at a restaurant, and I said, instead of everybody ordering, why don't we just leave it to the waiter to order for us and then see what he brings. 
and see what we might feel. Like whatever we're going to get, we're going to get something. And it begins to, you know, you begin to feel things. You're like, ah, but I don't really want the chicken. Like, should I tell him I don't want the chicken? Should I not tell him I don't want it? You know, and, and just feel what it feels like to take a risk like that and, and to feel yourself and not lose yourself. And, you know, that's life, right? Life serves, serves us up all sorts of things. Can we stay grounded in ourselves and receive what it is that life serves us without having it throw us? So that's one of the things that I like doing periodically. And, you know, the truth is the hardest part uh, goes to the waiter who's, you know, terrified that, you know, he or she might bring the wrong thing. So sometimes they're like, no, 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 I don't want to play that game. And I'm like, no, don't worry. I'm not going to get upset. Whatever you bring, it's fine. That's life, right? That's the randomness of life. And you talk about using focus as a filter. Can you give some examples of how this works? Sure. So, you know, unless we're thoughtful ahead of time about what it is that we want to accomplish, we will be knocked around by whatever life brings us. It's sort of the opposite of that story of the, of, of the food. You know, if, if I'm not thoughtful about what it is I want to achieve, then I'm going to look at my email and I'm going to achieve all the things other people want me to achieve, right? And I'm not going to be focused. So one of the first things that I suggest is to get really clear what are the top three, four, or five things you really want to accomplish and you really want to focus on over the next year, right? So to be clear about what that focus is, because you can't filter anything through a focus without knowing what your focus is first. So, you know, what is important to you and what do you really want to accomplish and move forward in? Here's the challenge that most people end up facing when they want to focus, but they end up working through days, weeks, months sometimes, and look back and say, I've been super busy, but I haven't accomplished my most important work. And, and this goes to the section on commitment to purpose, which is unless we're clear on what our purpose is, then we will have no way of knowing whether we're working towards it and filtering through with it. So the first thing we need to do before we even use focus as a filter is to be clear on our focus, right? To be clear on our purpose. And it doesn't have to be a huge thing. We're not talking about a lifelong purpose. And it, it, to think about the four to five things that are most important for you to focus on or to accomplish or to work on over the next year, right? Things that stand out. And when I do this exercise with people, usually they can come very, very quickly with four to five top things that come to mind, right? Doesn't have to be perfect, but these are the four or five things that I, I think I'll feel really good about if I, if I work on. And once you have that, now you've created the focus. So then the question is how you follow through on that focus. And, and I always suggest to people that they create a to-do list with that focus in mind. And I talk about this in the book, which is that your to-do list and my to-do list has, should have, my to-do list has five boxes in it. And those boxes at the head of each box is one of those areas of focus. So anytime a to-do comes in or a request comes in or something I want to work on, I'm forced to put it in one of these five boxes or I put it in the sixth box uh, called sort of the other 5%, right? And that's the box of things that I should not be spending more than 5% of my time on. So now I'm literally creating a filter for my focus that says anything I'm going to spend time on has to work its way through some of these boxes. And if everything's fitting into this sixth box called the other 5%, I'm not focusing properly. You know, another way to do it is to be, and I talk about this in the book also, to um, use coming back from vacation as a great opportunity to reestablish your focus. So when you're on vacation, you're away, and hopefully you're not checking your email all the time, and hopefully people are missing you, and you come back to work, and now you've got 300 emails, and you've got a whole lot of people who are wanting your attention for things. So before you talk to any of them or open up your email, get really clear, what are my top five things, or three things, or four things? What is my focus? What is the purpose that I'm committed to that I really want to bring people along with me and move forward? I want to inspire people to move with me in this area of focus. And then filter every email that you're looking at through that. If the, if the email comes in and it's got nothing to do with any of these top five areas, do everything you can to get it off your plate and not spend any time on it. And something that does have something to do with one of your top areas of focus, use it as leverage to move forward on what's most important to you. So you really want the lens to be, this is what I care about making happen, and I'm gonna make sure that I'm actually spending my time and energy and, and effort on these particular things. Uh, what is the mouthwash principle? 
I like the mouthwash principle, and this has to do both with the emotional courage, building your emotional courage, and also very much has to do with inspiring focused action around commitment to purpose, right? The, the confidence in self, connection to others, commitment to purpose. And if you really want people to be committed to a purpose, you got to be comfortable boring yourself with your own repetition. So the mouthwash principle is something that I noticed when I was brushing my teeth once and my, I went to my dentist and he said, you know, it's not enough to brush your teeth. You have to brush your teeth, you have to floss, you have to rinse, you have to use a pickster, which is, and I'm like, this is kind of overkill. And, and yet I did it, right? And what I noticed is I would floss and some stuff would come out and then I would brush my teeth and I would think I'm done. And then I would use the pickster and still I would find something. And then I would use the mouthwash and you know, the fourth level of cleanliness in my mouth, and yet something more would come out. And what, this might be grossing you out, I don't know, but it's sort of that sort of shampoo, like, you know, shampoo, rinse, repeat, and most of us don't actually shampoo, rinse, and repeat. We just shampoo and rinse, and it's kind of a, a way of shampoo companies to sell you, you know, more shampoo. But that's great instruction for communicating around your commitment to purpose. The mouthwash principle is you never get everything with the first swipe. You got to do it again and again and again and again. So when you have something important that you want people to be committed to, you have to talk about it and then you have to talk about it some more and you have to keep talking about it. And you keep doing it until you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, how, you know, they are going to get so bored and tired of me speaking about this thing. And that's a sign that you have to keep doing it because you're probably getting somewhere and people are gonna understand that commitment. One of the things you put forward in this section is three qualities that all leaders need to cultivate in their teams in order to have the capacity to grow. Can you talk a little bit more about all of these qualities? Yeah, this is something that I discovered actually when I was brought in. I'm a, one of the things I do is I'm an advisor to CEOs and their leadership teams and I was brought in to work with a, a CEO and a leadership team and he said, you know, look at my team, interview everybody, tell me what you think. And I interviewed everybody individually and spoke with them. And I actually was very impressed. I found that they were smart, they were committed, they were engaged, they had a sense of purpose, they knew what they were going after. So I went back to the CEO and I said, you know, I I've done the things I'm supposed to do to figure out if there's kind of an issue. And I got to say, I'm, I don't see an issue. I mean, I think you've got a very strong team of really competent, capable people. But I had an inkling and I said, I, the one thing I would love to do, which I haven't done, is I want to see them together in a meeting. And so I sat together in one of their strategy offsites. And all of these incredibly smart, individually capable people were very, very challenged when it came to working with each other. They were advocating for their particular position. They were advocating for their silo that they were working in. They were individually productive, but collectively really struggling. And so the challenge that they had, and it's the challenge that I talk about in this chapter, is what do we have to do in order to show up collectively together in alignment to work you know, what are the attributes that each of us needs in order to be able to work really well together? And I came up with three things, gifted, game, and generous. And what I mean by that is, yes, they have to be individually capable. Like you need gifted people. That's an attribute that you need on a team. The second is game, which is you need people to be willing, willing to feel things, willing to listen, willing to connect with others, willing to, um, uh, take a chance or take a risk. They have to be willing to do that, otherwise they're not useful members of the team. And finally, what you need is generous. You need people who say, this might not be in my individual personal best interest, but it is in our collective best interest. So I'm going to support the thing that you are, that's really important to you, that you find that you really need, because I know that that will be better for the whole team even if it's not particularly better for me individually. So gifted, game, and generous are three things you really want to look for in a team. And did you find that um, these, these people were a little bit more receptive to that once you introduced the concept to them? Yeah, so I was able to show them, look, you're all gifted, right? You're all incredibly skilled. And there are ways in which you're game, but you're not very generous with each other. And, and let me point out the ways in which I'm seeing a gap, and you tell me if you see this gap too. And it would be hard for them at that moment to argue, no, 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 we're super generous with each other because 
they could see the ways in which they're advocating for their position at the exclusion of someone else's position. They're not listening very well, they're arguing with each other, and sometimes they're even you know, making the other person look bad. And so you, you can't really have an effective team in that way, and so they were able to see that. Well, I have one final question for you. Uh, leaders often face risk and uncertainty. How does emotional courage prepare them to deal directly with these kind of situations that can often derail themselves or their teams? You know, this comes to the heart of emotional courage, and it's interesting because I don't know that we've spoken about it yet, really, about what you know, emotional courage is. We touched on it in the first question, but emotional courage is the willingness to feel the discomfort that we need to feel in order to move forward in the things that we need to move forward in, right? And so, so let me, we'll do this little thought experiment, right? Think of a hard conversation that you should have, that you know you want to have, but you've resisted having. Okay, can you think of one? Absolutely. I'm not going to make you say it out loud, Great. so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> now, think about why you haven't yet had that conversation. And I'm willing to bet you know exactly what you want to say. I'm willing to bet you've had plenty of opportunity to say it. And I'm willing to bet you have the skills to be able to say it. And so the question is, then why haven't you? If you have the knowledge and the time and the capability, and it's because there's something you don't want to feel. Because if you have this conversation, you're going to risk something. You're going to risk the potential disconnection with the other person. Their embarrassment or shame or defensiveness. Your own shame or defensiveness. Your anger. Their anger. I don't know what it is. Conflict. But you're going to have to risk feeling some of that if you're going to have this conversation. It's going to be a risk. And so we stall doing the things that are going to be a risk to us. We stall doing them because we don't want to feel that stuff. We don't want to feel disconnected or conflict or shame or embarrassment, sometimes joy. We don't want to feel some of these things, and so we stop ourselves from doing it. So behind every risk that anybody takes, and you cannot succeed as a leader, you cannot succeed as a human being without being willing to take risk. Behind every single risk that somebody takes is a willingness to feel something. I have to be willing to feel that the risk won't work out. I have to be willing to feel that I failed at what I was trying to do. Otherwise, it's not a risk. And we live very small, contained lives. But if you want to live big, if you want to live successfully, if you want to live a life that entails risks, some of which won't pay off, some of which will pay off, but that all of which creates an ability to expand who you are in the world. If you want that, you have to be willing to feel everything that comes along with it. And repressing those feelings doesn't allow us to move through them. It just forces them out to leak in insidious ways that end up looking like passive aggressiveness or end up looking like you know, resistance to change or whatever else. Right? So that willingness to feel emotional courage underlies every risk that we take, and we cannot succeed in the world without taking risks. Thank you, Peter. I invite you to take a look yourself by adding Leading with Emotional Courage to your playlist.